Exceptional Achievement, sponsored by ASOS. Jackie Walker and Chris Niven. Two supermarket employees were hailed as heroes after saving the life of a baby who had swallowed his tongue. Jackie and Chris rushed to the aid of the one-year-old child, providing life-saving assistance until paramedics arrived. My name's Chris Niven. Last March, I was working in the ASDA. Um, my main role in the ASDA was to fill up shelves and uh, occasionally serve customers. So on this particular occasion, I was um, stacking up some shelves. I heard some really um, frightening screaming, calling from, from a lady and she was really distressed and by the time I'd got down from the ladder and got down the aisle, um, she was laid on the floor, really, really distressed and there were lots and lots of customers around who were horrified and didn't know what to do. Dad had taken the little baby, who I now know is called Ronnie, out of his pushchair and was just holding him and looked absolutely terrified and the baby um, was looking blue. So trying to make a quick assessment of what was happening, I said, has this ever happened before? Does, does, does the baby suffer from fits? And he said, no, this has never happened before. So at that moment, fortunately, my colleague Jackie came over and was very, very decisive, took hold of the baby and tipped him upside down. And I started rubbing the baby's back and then she was putting her finger in his mouth and, and trying to resuscitate him. And slowly he came round and, and his colour came back. Um, but for a few moments, we, I was really terrified that, that we'd lost him. Fortunately, another colleague from the ASDA who was on the tills had called for the ambulance almost at the outset of this incident. And um, the ambulance seemed to be there in absolutely no time whatsoever. So with Jackie tipping the baby and, and me massaging the baby and her putting her finger in, in his mouth, he was coming round and then the ambulance personnel came in, immediately took the baby from us, told mum to come with us and they went off into the, into the ambulance. And subsequent to that, we've, we've met again with Ronnie and, and Ronnie's mum Lucy. And uh, fortunately, it was a very positive outcome. He's absolutely fine from a very terrifying incident. And just finally, I can say that um, about two hours later, when I was again stacking the shelves, my colleague Jackie walked past and, and I said to her, are you feeling okay, Jackie? And she said, yes, it's just another day at the ASDA. Desiree Peters. Care home nurse Desiree will forever be known as an angel to one family after she saved the life of a two-year-old girl who suffered a serious medical episode. I'm a nurse at Olive Tree Lodge, care home. I've been working at Olive Tree Lodge for the past three and a half years, almost four years. And the day started uh, quite a normal day, the day in question, routine, doing everything, and then around tea time, it was, I was doing tea time med medications for the residents when one of the care staff alerted me that there was a, um, a lady at the door. She was knocking on the door with a child in her arms and the child doesn't look well. So I immediately, I was on the ground floor, so I went straight to the door and there was this grandmother, and then I know it was a grandmother with this child in her arms. Child was lifeless, blue, you could see, you could see the child wasn't breathing well, the child was g gasping, and she just, you know, she just um, put the child in, in my arms and said, please help, please help, please help, right? And I sat down with the child, because um, I'm thinking as a child, I've never worked with, with children, in a sense, you know, only during training time. And I put the child over on my, on my, my lap, right? And I tried to check her area, make sure her area is clear, and I started to, I had her head down, and her head torn so that, I could see her ear, I don't want to put my hands in her mouth to cause any, and I tried to rub her back and I tried to, you know, massage her and then try to make sure that there's no secretion was coming, try to clear it out and everything. And then it lasts about five minutes or, or so with this child not responding. Eventually she started to make some songs, 
some groaning songs like, and then in the meantime, the grandmother, she went and she tried to call the ambulance and my other colleague came eventually, one of my other um, staff that was there came eventually. By the time then, the grandmother got hold of the ambulance and, and was relating, but the child was start responding. Then the ambulance person the ambulance telling me what to do, but I already was doing whatever she was doing. Put her on the table in the dining room and she was already crying and she was already responding. So by the time the ambulance came, she was already, already responding and everything. But in that moment, that moment, it was a bit of what, what is really going to happen, you know? Yeah, so I was glad I was there on duty and I felt so privileged, not because of what I'm doing, but just because we see that care room nurses are being recognized, you know? Afterwards, she went to hospital, the, the little child went to hospital eventually, and the grandmother and the mother, they, they, they kept in touch. We were get to see Len, Len, Lenny, in a real in a real self she was a normal child and i was so proud that i could see her again you know so i was me on, on that day claire hackett eager grieving mother claire gained fifty thousand signatures as part of her petition to raise awareness and funds for ewing's sarcoma a rare form of cancer that claimed the life of her son i started this petition because I'm wanting to help others and increase funding and awareness for sarcomas, um, bone cancers like Ewing's and other sarcomas. That's affecting young, young lives, young people. Um, my son got diagnosed three years ago and unfortunately he's not with us anymore. Um, and he had Ewing's sarcoma on his spinal cord. He was paralysed from waist down. He was 19 when he got diagnosed and, and then he, he didn't make his 21st birthday but we still celebrate and we still had his party for him and but it's just the treatment it's so harsh what they have to go through so I want to try and save save as many as I can all these kids that are having to go through it and they shouldn't be going through it it's like been two years now and it's so hard. But they just needs more funding, more awareness for, for these um, sarcomas. <sighs> um, and currently the treatment is like over 30 years old. There's no like new treatments, no funding for it. So um, I started the petition to make more awareness and, and to create more funding because it's affecting young lives. Um, people as young as maybe six year old getting this, these sarcomas and they're not, they're not living, they're not living. So I started this, I've um, raised money doing other various things for Teenage Cancer Trust. Uh, me and my friends did a, a skydive, we've done various Tough Mudders um, just to help other teenagers going through all this horrible disease and hopefully they can find a cure but I need to get a hundred thousand signatures but I've got like over 50, 52,000 at minute so I'm hoping to get 100 so I can send it on to Parliament maybe so um, I've started doing crochet, crocheting animals for kids with cancer just to, I don't know, put a bit of smile on the face um, and that's what I'll keep doing, just keep fundraising and donating to Teenage Cancer Trust and I hope I, I, do, I, hope I can make a difference because it's, um, they're saying it's a rare cancer, but the more you, you hear in, more stories about it, saying, oh, you know, another one's got your wings, another one, it's not as rare as what what they're saying. And the treatment's so harsh, the, you know, the transfusions and the, the infections and you know, being in and out of hospital, I mean, he finished his treatment nine months. He had nine months of treatment. And then when he stopped, he, were, he got all clear and two months he started getting pain again and it had gone to his lungs so he was never really clear and he, he was gone in three weeks after that. End of life care team. A team of palliative care specialists are providing invaluable support to terminally ill patients and their families. The team offers compassionate care, ensuring comfort and dignity during the most difficult times. I think the main thing for us is that 
the, the person-centred bit um, that we do bring and, and, and try and bring really. So it's all, all about the person and those that are important to them and actually finding out what is important to them, what matters most to them and trying to make sure that we achieve that for them. So ultimately the people that we work with are, are incredibly poorly um, and, and will die. So it is important that we, we try and do everything that we can and work alongside our colleagues to, to achieve that. I always support each other as a team, so we've got really supportive colleagues and I think you've got to be a special kind of person to want to do all that work really because it is upsetting and we just have to support each other with that. We've worked on care that we've delivered and asked for like doing this urgent for people's outlooks and just feedback and things like that and what works and what doesn't and just be able to offload sometimes it's making that difference at a time that's never going to be nice for people but making it as good as it, it can be. Well there is a reward for us is actually achieving what people want to achieve as much as what we possibly can. I think that, that is the, the thing for me and has, has brought me into palliative and end of life care. It is very much about that, that person. So we can help to keep people at home, so if they want to, if they prefer a place of death is home, then we'll try our best for supporting teams and community for that to happen, to enable that to happen. It's about managing symptoms towards the end of the life, making, trying to, you know, get on top of any sort of pain, um, that kind of thing, so that, that person is comfortable as they can be in the final sort of days and hours. I think we're truly committed to um, this person-centred approach. We don't shy away from these difficult conversations. Um, we often obviously have to listen to people because not everybody wants to have these conversations, but we don't shy away from that. And, and when you've asked about how we cope and how we deal with things, I think there is something about getting it right for them. Um, but yeah, I think, I think this, the thing for us as well is the expertise that we've got within the team. So um, our speciality is palliative and end-of-life care. Uh, we've all done extra uh, academic qualifications, years at, at working in this, this area. This is our chosen field, if you like, that we want to work in.